Okay, we seem to have a quorum. We're in a good place in space and time. It gives me great pleasure to introduce the Commandant of the Marine Corps, General Neller. So I, I'm not gonna use the podium. It's just the story as I was in New York a couple of years ago at an event, and I got up and I read from a script, and Bing West was there, and he grabbed me afterwards and said, you were terrible. <laughs> Don't ever do that again. And first I got upset. But then because I know this guy, I said, you know, he's trying to help you, Neller. And so since that day, I have never read a script. So I have no idea what I'm going to say right now. <laughs> um, so, I mean, and that's, that's pretty much the truth. So let me, I want to try to do three things today. First, I'll tell you a little bit about what your Marines are doing. Second, I'll talk about ideas that we've been working on and changes we're making institutionally, organizationally, capability-wise. And then I want to talk about how we think we're going to fight in the next five to 15 years. So right now, we're about 186,000 Marines, about 38,000 in reserves, uh, about 34 to 35,000 of those Marines at any one time are forward deployed. Uh, on ship or on land. Um, we've got Marines in Iraq, we've got Marines in Syria, we've got Marines in Afghanistan, we've got Marines. We just got approval today from the Norwegian government to put another 300 Marines that are currently in Romania into Norway. So, something we've been working on. Um, we've got Marines in Maron, Spain, we've got Marines in Sigonella, we've got Marines in Australia for our six month uh, Marine force there in Darwin. About 1,500 Marines this year, and they, for the first time, have artillery and MV-22 Ospreys in Hueys. Um, it's good training, but it, there's, there's a certain amount of degree of difficulty to get in and out of Australia, if anybody's ever been there, uh, because they have a very demanding agricultural inspection. But um, <laughs> we got Marines in Okinawa, and we're in the process, uh, we've, we have uh, first deployable F-35 squadron is in Iwakuni. They just went out on the uh, Bon Amr Shard uh, with the 31st Mew. And then this last Saturday, the 30, 13th Mew was set sail here in about a month on the Essex, and they're gonna be the first six month deployment with F-35s. And we went out to see them on the boat on uh, Saturday and then went into El Centro and four F-35s came in in the break, landed, and then a C-130 was there and they got refueled. So this is not an, this is not an idea. I mean, we're doing this. We're doing this and the airplane, the, despite what you read in the paper, what you hear about, other than the fact that it is, it is really expensive. But it works. It works and ask any Air Force pilot up at now list what happens when the F-35 shows up. They get ass whipping. And they don't even know what happened. I mean, those are from Air Force guys telling me this. Vice Chief of Staff of the Air Force, or Vice Chief of, or Vice uh, Chairman Paul Silva says, he says, you know what they call the F-35? They call it big, fat, ugly kid in magic suit. <laughs> so we're able to recruit. We closed out the year. Uh, we've got two or three young men or women for every spot to be a Marine officer. We're, we're making our mission every month in recruiting. We're going to make our mission. Now we're signing up people for next fiscal year, and our goal is to get to the beginning of 1 October to have 53% of the people we're going to send to boot camp already in the can come 1 October. How do we do that? Our recruiters work really hard. They work, they don't sit in their office, they're out there working their tails off to go out there and find young men and women. So you all have equity in that. I mean, everybody in here is a recruiter. I'm commissioning you, deputizing you, whatever you want to say right now. So if you know somebody out there uh, who's interested in serving their nation and you think they might do well as a Marine, send them our way and we'll see if they can pass muster. Because we're pretty picky. I don't know if Bing and I would make it in today. So. We're in a good place. So let's talk about what's going on to think about the future, because I know that's what you're here talking about. Next slide. So 
when I assumed this office, and it's amazing how fast it's gone, and everybody told me how fast it would go. Some days it didn't seem like it was going fast enough, but um, it'll, I mean, I'm coming up on three years in September. And just so you know, next year, um, every service chief, less uh, the Air Force, and the chairman and the vice chairman are all going to turn over. So something that will kind of stagger out. But we had a document called Expeditionary Force 21 that talked about how we were going to fight and the things and the capabilities that we needed. And we reviewed that, and we created a document called the Marine Operational Concept. And it was based on this fundamental problem they were trying to solve, that we didn't believe that we as a Marine Corps were currently organized, trained, and equipped to fight and defeat a pure adversary in the year 2025. That was the problem. That's what we were trying to fix. And we based that assessment based on a, a document called the Future Operating Environment that our Marine Corps Intelligence Activity had done, which said that the world is changing, and the fight that you're going to fight is going to have to deal with these five drivers of change that you see up there. And when you think about it, since the march up OIF-1, we have been basically in a counterinsurgency stability out. We've been fighting terrorism. We've been fighting a very worthy, brave adversary willing to die for what they believed in, but an adversary that could, could not contest us on the net, could not deny us the network, did not have precision, didn't have an air force, didn't have long-range precision fires, had no armor-protected maneuver, had nothing in space, Actually, they do have a bit of an Air Force now flying uh, DJI quadcopters and other drones that they deliver munitions with. And they don't have much mobility other than driving around in commercial vehicles or vehicles that they've stolen from us or our, our allies. But they're willing to die. They have uh, IEDs, suicide, vehicle, however you want to do it. And as effective in, as we've been and as courageous and uh, as our soldiers, sailor, airmen have been, they've given us a handful. They give us a handful. I mean, they're still standing after 17 years. So what's going to happen if we fight somebody, like many of the people in this room, remember the Soviet Union, and that's how I grew up in the Marine Corps, when we were worried about electronic warfare. We were worried about artillery, regimental artillery groups. We were worried about rockets. We were worried about armor protected maneuver. We were worried about getting jammed. We were worried about staying in a position too long. Because if you, you know, stay too long, you can be found. If you can be found, you can be targeted. If you can targeted, you can be killed. But we haven't had to do that. We went to the same place. We laid fiber optic cable. We went in the same COC. We had big screen TVs. We never broke our COC down. We never had to move because we didn't have to. Now we're going to have to. So all the lessons that I learned that some of many of you taught me are going to have to be reapplied. Because the domains, not just air, land, and sea, but under the sea, space, cyber, information domain are all contested. They're contested every day. They're contested every single day right now as we sit in this room. There's a fight going on. Some people would tell you that informationally and in digitally, we're in phase 2.5 against potential countries and adversaries. The signature, I didn't worry about my signature. I could have all the radios on. What are they going to do to me? There's nothing going to do to me. Now we worry about signature. You've got fleet commanders now as, as surface action groups, carrier strike groups, amphibious ready groups go across the ocean. They're turning all their stuff off. And they, want, they want to navigate and be able to operate. And we do that as a matter of course, because we want to be able to operate without giving off a signature. Information is a weapon. We see that. I mean, all you got to do is turn on the TV. Information, information has always been a weapon. But social media and 24-hour news and just all the different venues where people get their news or information is, is part of the battle space. The, pl I don't, the proliferation of technology, I mean, on 9-11, you know, we didn't even, I mean, there, were, there were cell phones, but, and if you were texting, you thought you were pretty high speed. Now you think about it. iPhone comes out, you've got Samsung phone with uh, that software. You've, you've got a, a young man or woman has in their hand the computing power of the President of the United States 20 years ago, maybe more. 
and it's there right now, immediately. And we've got, we're pushing this technology down. It used to be there was a digital divide. So at the, at the turn of the, of the century, the digital divide was probably between division and regiment. Now it's down, it's to the bottom, it's to the individual Marine soldier or sailor, that they've got the capability. If the network is up, if the network is up, that's a big if. They've got the ability to see things and get a battle space awareness that's beyond anything you've been in, you could envision even 20 years ago. And then terrain. I mean, we've fought the last few years. Uh, we've been in some mount or some urban areas, but for the most part, the system, that the, the, the way of war fighting that we've devised works really great when there's not a lot of vegetation, when there's not a lot of complex terrain, when you can see, you can target, you know, there's, you know, you worry about dust, but there's not a whole lot of places to hide in the, in the middle of a desert or open terrain. And that's where we've been fighting. Once you start to make that terrain complex, when you start to get into to, to jungle or to urban jungle, the systems that we have, it's harder to see, it's harder to, it's harder to pick up the signature of the enemy, it's harder to maneuver. I mean, think about trying to go into a city like Manila to find somebody or to fight a fight against an adversary in there. I mean, the capacity, you, you would just be consumed. So all these things have driven us to take a look at our force and to consider the capabilities and sets that we've had. So we've decided that on the little box on the right, these are the things that we have to have to fight and defeat a, a, a peer adversary in the future. So you've got cyber operations, you've got information environment, you've got electronic warfare. We're going to be more effective and more involved in robotics, manned and unmanned teaming, and additive manufacturing to say a number of things. So we've got to change. The only thing we can't do is stay the same. And that sometimes is a tough sell. Because it doesn't mean that what we were before was bad. It doesn't mean that we, didn't, that we didn't struggle mightily. It doesn't mean that we didn't do a good job. It doesn't mean that we were not effective. It just means that, hey, the situation's changed, and you can't stay static. And anybody in the business world would tell you that, because things are just happening so much faster. They're just turning so fast. And our adversaries, or our would-be adversaries, or anybody out there, you know, they haven't been consumed with an insurgency in a fight like we've had. They didn't have a force to recapitalize. They had nothing. They could grow the thing from the bottom up. So all their stuff is new. It's very effective. The one thing they don't have is the experience that we have. So that's where we are. Next slide. So what have we done? Um, we came up. We, we got two groups of people. Actually, we had... Uh, a scarlet and a gold team, take a look at our force structure, and we deliberately did it. So we had one group was, the, was, the, was composed of colonels. So we had the old people group. And then we had the other group was all majors and captains. And said, OK, tell us what you think the Marine Corps should look like. Well, you can imagine they probably found somewhat different designs. But there was a certain commonality in what they did. And so they briefed it out to leadership. And basically, all those capabilities that we think we needed, cyber, information, electronic warfare, air defense, more engineering, the ability to do more intel analysis, but not just to sense, because we've got sensors. But the thing is, we have to sense, and to quote Major General Mike Grohn, you have to sense and then make sense. It doesn't do any good to sense if you can't make sense. What's that mean? I mean, an intel guy stands up and briefs. Well, they could attack, they could defend, they could delay, they could withdraw, they could reinforce. Thank you, that's very helpful. <laughs> what do you think they're going to do? They could attack, they could defend, they could delay. No, this is, you can't lose here. So if I agree with you, then I own it. If I disagree with you, I own it. So tell me what you think they're going to do. So this is the cap these are the capabilities that we thought. So then the question can't became, OK, how much? Are we going to add in these cap capabilities? And what are you going to give up to pay for that? Because at the time, we didn't think we were going to get any bigger. In fact, we thought we were going to get smaller. Because at the time, we were about 182, and we were still in sequestration. We were in the bu Bipartisan Budget Act II. There wasn't a lot of money. We didn't have this. We still don't have a, a, an authorization for 19, but you know we've got an, we got authorization for 18 that we got in April, and now the discussion going on for 19, and we don't believe that the money is going to be at this level beyond this year. I mean, 
you know, you can hope. Hope's not a course of action, but be prepared for the worst. The worst could be go back to sequestration. So we weren't counting on an increase in end strength. So we had to do some puts and takes, and we've got plans. I mean, we could go, we could get a little bit bigger, but we got plans to get smaller. But we have to have these capabilities. So the Marine Corps organizes itself in Marine Air Ground Task Forces. There's four components to that. There's a headquarters or command element. There's a ground and aviation and logistical element. We will always and continue to organize ourselves in that way. And in each of those, we've made some changes. The biggest change probably is in the command element. We used to have a, a, an organization called the MEF Headquarters Group, and it was kind of like a core level headquarters, and it was kind of an agglomer a, a conglomeration of Intel Battalion, Communications Battalion, SIGINT, or Radio Battalion, Anglico, and it was just kind of a H&S kind of you know, housekeeping thing. Now they actually have a functional role. They are the MEF Information Group, and that commander is involved with the MEF headquarters, our, our three-star core level headquarters, to provide information and cyber and electronic warfare information and support and design to the orders and to the execution of an operation. And it's gonna take us a while to get there because the people that we need to do that are not PFCs, brand new Marines. We're gonna to have to grow them, we're gonna to have to retain them, we're gonna to have to educate them, we're gonna to have to train them. The rest of the stuff is just things to make it different because we didn't think, we, we thought we needed to make some changes. The infantry is on that side, but I think the big thing is, we talked about communications. Um, every infantry squad in the Marine Corps is gonna have their own, they're gonna fly their own quadcopter, their own UAV. So instead of like, okay, PFC West, go up there and see what's on the other side of the hill. PFC West, go fly the quadcopter up and see what's on the other side of the hill. So a guy asked me, he says, what happens if the quadcopter goes, gets shot down? I go, well, we'll know there's something on the other side of the hill. <laughs> and PFC West is still alive, so it's a win-win. It's <laughs> on the aviation side, the F-35 is, is a big player. And I think the F-35, not just because of its stealth, because of, of its ability to evade radars, not all radars, I mean, every, Every weapon system can be countered, but really it's this information processing capability and the thing that's gonna be able to see into the battlefield and see beyond and then be able to bring that information back and send it down. It's probably more information we've ever had, so we're gonna to have to figure out how to analyze that and make sense of it. Uh, we know we, we're gonna face an adversary that has a, an aviation capability, whether it be manned or unmanned. We, we pretty much got rid of all our air defense. We remember the Marine Corps back in the day, we used to have Hawk missiles. We got rid of all that. I mean, there hasn't been, a, when was the last time an, an enemy airplane dropped a bomb on a US ground force? Korea, maybe. World War II, but it's been a while. Unless you count a quadcopter flying over and dropping an uh, M203 grenade on top of a force in, uh, in Mosul, which happened. So how do you defend against that? How do you defend against swarming drones? What happens if 500 mini drones, all weaponized, come zorching out of the sky? What are you gonna do to shoot them down? Right now, I mean, that's, like, that's a great question. Lasers, you're gonna jam them? I mean, you got, got potentially, I mean, that's, so remember when they, uh, they did the Olympics, you know, and, another, and at the end of the Winter Olympics, and they had all the drones in the air, and all the lights on, a big light show? What if, all, and they all went into formations and doing all that stuff? What if all those drones had an had a, had a, had a explosive device on them? And they all came at the same time. I mean, that's, that's not next year, that's like right now. So how do we defend against that? So we need air defense, and we need uh, a Group 5 UAV that we can operate off the ship. So we need to have some long-range, sustainable ISR strike platform that's unmanned that we can operate off a ship or in a very small expeditionary platform. And so we're, we've, got a, we've got a defined requirement for that, and we're going to work on that. On the logistics side, because we do come from the sea, we need to work on our, our engineering capability. We've got to increase our lift. Um, we're looking at autonomous ways to resupply ourselves. 
whether it be pallets that fly, which again are things that are happening right now, additive manufacturing, the ability to use 3D printing to print our own stuff is something that's going on and we're leveraging as much as we can. Uh, we've got over 70 labs around the Marine Corps where we have young Marines with various qualities of 3D printers that are out printing stuff. And it's going to do a lot of things. It's going to make us more expeditionary. It's going to untether us from the supply chain. And I think it's going to save us a lot of money. So my, my aha moment is I'm, I'm, it's a Friday afternoon. I'm at camp. I'm at New River Air Station. It's cold and wet. And I'm on the way home. And I really want to go home. But I haven't stopped at this last place. And I said, OK, fine. We'll go see him. So we go in there. And it's a Marine Air Logistics Squadron. And they're in these little, these little vans that they work in, and I go in there, and there's this Lance Corporal standing there, standing at attention, and he's got his little 3D printer, and I go, okay, hey, Marine, how you doing? What's going on? He goes, so he shows me the intercom, the box, or the front plate to an ICS intercom system on a, on a helicopter, and they're in al almost all the aircraft, and the button, the knob had broken, okay, and I said, okay, so he goes, well, I printed a new button, a new knob. I said, okay, well, what's the big deal? He goes, well, I can't order the button because the unit of issue for this thing is the faceplate, and the faceplate costs 11,000 bucks. And I printed the button for two cents. <laughs> but Navair said I can't put the button on because it's not authorized. <laughs> I said, just print a bag of them and hang them in the plane and let's go. <laughs> and that's now approved. I mean, but, and it wasn't, I'm not picking on Navair. Well, I'm picking on Navair. But, <laughs> But now we've got like several hundred parts that we've printed that are up there for approval. And all they got to do is say yes. It's not dynamic. It's not safety of flight stuff. It's not dynamic. That's coming. Because when I sit down with vendors and they're selling us this really outrageous stuff and I say to them, hey, do you, do you, I just, you know, I'm just a dumb infantry guy, state college guy. I mean, do you guys do like 3D printing for this? Oh, yeah, we print lots of parts. I said, then why aren't I printing? Why am I paying you if I can print it? And then the room gets real quiet like this one. <laughs> I'll pay you. I'll pay you for the tech data package. I'll pay you for the rights because you that's your intellectual property. But I don't want parts from you. I want the, I want, I want the trons of the tech data package because I can print this stuff myself. And we just took possession of our first two metal printers at Albany at 1st Marine Logistics Battalion, or 1st uh, Maintenance Battalion. We're printing in metal. Like aluminum, titanium. So think about that. You're out on a ship, you're in the middle of nowhere, and something breaks, and then you just type in, hey, print me one of these, and you know, Lance Corporal Neller down, he's like, yes, sir. Boom. 12 hours later. I got it. And the thing about digital printing, it's the same. It's perfect every time. It's the same. And now I don't have to do anything. And my readiness goes up, and it changes the way we fight. Next slide. So how are we going to fight? So we haven't had to fight to get to the fight since World War II. We pretty much went where we wanted to go. We thought about fighting to get in the fight in the Cold War, but we haven't had to fight to get the fight since World War II. We just went, we've, we've got on a ship, we got on a plane, we flew what we wanted to do, we arrived, we RSO and I'd the force, we set up, we arrayed the force, and we just waited until we got ready to go. And nobody could do anything about it. Those days are gone. Those days are gone. We're going to have to fight to get to the fight. I don't think, and it's not just the physical. I mean, think about all the networks that we need just to order transportation. Do you think an adversary is just going to let us get on an unclassified network and order airplanes and military shipping and just let us do what we want without potentially disrupting that? So every day, the, for, the joint force, but particularly your naval force, your Navy and Marine Corps are out there in the contact there. The National Defense Strategy talks about four groups. There's the, there's the contact force, the force that's in potential contact every day, the blunt force, the force that's able to receive a blow from an adversary, the surge force that comes from the continental United States to the fight, and then there's the homeland defense force. So your Navy and Marine Corps, we're the contact force. 
and we're the blunt force, and we're out in an A2 AD environment every day, the bad guy just hadn't turned on the switch. They just haven't turned it on. So we've got to be able to operate in that layer to assure our allies and deter the bad guy. But we don't have the capability to do that. I mean, we, we got to be able to do sea control, sea denial. And we think we can do that as Marines from the land. If we have long range precision strike and we use the geography that exists in most places, choke points, think Malacca Strait, Bab el Mandeb, Suez, Baltic, South China Sea. And there's a lot of land out there. And we think we can participate in that maritime command and control. Now to do that, we need to have some sort of anti-ship cruise missile or anti-ship missile. We've got to be aware of our signature. We've got to be able to move. Uh, we can't stay in a place too long. The Navy has a concept that I've learned and I think it makes it called taxit. You know, I can't be seen, I can't be targeted. I, I can be seen, but I can't, I, I can be seen, I could be targeted, I can be seen, I'm gonna be targeted. So we gotta be aware of where we are and what's going on. And we obviously have gotta be able to do mines, particularly for an amphibious assault, if there's no other place to go. And then you'll see these other capabilities that we're working on that we need, that we believe we need to conduct operations in a littorals. And it's almost back to the future. One of the traditional missions of the Marine Corps, other than be the nation's fortress in readiness and be ready when the nation is least ready, least ready, confirmed and affirmed by two sessions of Congress, is that we secure and it seize advanced naval bases for the prosecution of a naval campaign. That's what we do. And so it's almost back to Earl Pete Ellis and the individual thoughts about operating in the Pacific. And I went to Guadalcanal last August for the 75th anniversary of the Marines landing on Guadalcanal. And walked that ground and looked at Henderson Field and where those Marines defended that. And, and they, they had seized and secured an advanced naval base. And out of that base flew Army Air, Navy Air, Marine Air. They were, every, the Navy fought a surface campaign of, of great distinction and, and uh, valor out in, the, in those surrounding sea areas. A pretty interesting concept. I'm not saying we're going back to the future, but we have to be able to do something similar to that. Probably not stay there that long, we have to be able to move. So how does the fight go? Next slide. So this is a busy slide, but I think you know, if, if you're in the fight, and I'll, I'll try to, I'm running out of time, and I'll try to get you back on time. So if, if in the digital domain, in the space, we're, we're fighting like right now. There's fights going on. If you talk to people that work for US Cybercom, there's fighting people trying to get in our networks, trying to get in our defense contractors, steal our stuff, muck up our stuff, do recon, leave behind, stay behinds that we may or may not know about. That fight goes on every single day and there's soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines out there on keyboards, you know, it doesn't sound like a fight, but they're in the fight, defending networks. And so we've got to defend our network, just like we want to deny the adversary theirs, because they're relying on their network too. And they're creating their own network with their own space-based capabilities. So let's assume that we have to move a force, a naval force, could be comprised of carrier strike groups, surface action groups, amphibious ready groups, amphibious forces, we're going to need submarines to screen the way. We're going to need unmanned and manned aircraft in front of us to surveil the space. We're going to have to see from space. We're going to have to have connectivity, and we're going to have to move forward. And at some point, there'll be something's going to go bump in the night. Now, you can look um, in the South Pacific to see where certain countries are out there right now buying concessions for ports and airfields and spending lots of money to gain geographical advantage. It's not a secret. I mean, it's open press, it's right out there. And sadly, I don't see us doing a whole lot to contest that. If you're familiar with the, the Chinese game of Go, where you put marbles on the board, okay, they're out there putting marbles down and we, and we got no marbles. <laughs> we got old marbles, but pretty soon, there's not gonna be any place to put any more marbles if, if, you don't, if they don't start doing something. And the Russians are doing similar things in different parts of the world. 
So at some point, we, have to, we may want to go ashore. We want to be able to do sea control. We may want to deny a, a certain uh, geographical access point between land. There's a reason they call them choke points, because there's land on either side. And it's a sea lane. And so if we were to occupy that point like we were here, we would go forward, uh, we would occupy a space, we would bring with us the ability to land, arm, and refuel F-35Bs, which have a short takeoff vertical landing capability. We would put our long-range missiles on there, and we would try to control the sea space from the land, allowing maybe other platforms, longer-range platforms, like cruisers, destroyers, or frigates that have long-range shooters, or our aircraft carriers to do a certain amount of standoff where they would stay and come in and out of the system, come in out of the battle space as required. So we've got to be able to maintain our communications. We've got to be able to move back and forth. We've got to be able to jam the enemy's communications, deny them the ability to see us, and preserve our ability to command and control ourselves. So. That's the type of thing we're practicing. That's the type of thing we're working on. Every ARG MU that goes out is going to, they've been directed to you know, figure out how to go from ship to a land base, set up a forward arming refueling point, pump gas, do weapons, pick up, move it again, set it up, do it again, and then go on to the next, or go back to the ship. And use the sea as maneuver space and try to be survivable. So we'll find out if it's going to work. But we've got to get back into a maneuver warfare concept where we want to take advantage of, of the geography that's out there to include uh, maybe, not, maybe much more of an indirect approach. And we're going to practice and rehearse this along with our shipmates and along with other things that are going on, uh, try to give ourselves a better opportunity against a peer adversary who may be tying themselves to land bases that we want to remain untied to, that we want to be able to maneuver from the sea. Next slide. So at the end of the day, that's, that's who we're doing this for, those Marines. Um, we're able to recruit, like I said. Uh, they're young. Um, we have the benefit. 62% of the Marine Corps is under the age of 25. Welcome to my world. <laughs> So the, the goal is to leverage all the good things that there are about being 25 and figure out how to mitigate all the other things there are about being 25. <laughs> and the great, great, great majority of them, just like our sailors, they do a great job. And we should be proud of them. Uh, they know they're going to be held accountable. They know they want to be tested. And it's our job to make sure that we give them the best equipment that we can, but allow them to use their intellect and their ingenuity and their innovativeness uh, as digital natives to be successful on a battlefield. So I got done before time was up, and I got five minutes, or I'll stay here as long as you want to ask questions. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Hi, General. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, I'm not going to ask you a question. I'm going to offer a suggestion since we're all so quiet about technology. But I would suggest that in the case of swarming drone attacks, that the Israelis have put together something that's quite interesting. It's a combination of aerosolized aluminum powder and iron oxide 3. And when you mix those together and you illuminate it with a relatively weak radar source, mm -hmm. it will explode. So you could create easily clouds of this material. And they, the theory they have is that when you're fighting a small uh, opponent, you have to fight with something even smaller. Mm -hmm. The other thing, which is going to sound kind of nuts, is aerosolized glue. And they're using that in liquid form to potentially destroy the airfoil surface of small microdrones. I don't think that sounds crazy at all. I'm just trying to figure out how I'm going to deliver it. <laughs> I mean, I guess the, the, the point is there's a counter for everything. Now you just got a question. I mean, from simple stuff like shooting it to trying to break the link to doing something. But that, that's like one-on-one. -on -one. 
I'm going to have to have something that delivers the thing like a cloud at a distance. Okay, you need to write, um, you know, again, I'm a history major, you need to write down the, the, the substance you're, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not that hard to find. Anybody else? You guys are making it way too easy. Yes, sir. Well, I appreciate that, but I just want a budget. <laughs> so I, I, I would trade a known amount of money for an extended period of time for, as, as opposed to every year coming down and having this drama. I mean, we might shut the government down again in September. I mean, it's possible because th there was an authorization, but there's not an appropriation. So as they go through the, the marks as they are now between the Senate and the House, and they're going to go to conference, and their the goal is to have a budget for 19. We don't have a budget. We don't have an authorization of funds. So they pass an, an authorization for $716 billion. I mean, that's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. But it's just, that's a, just a mark on the wall. So I would trade more for certainty. Because I can't plan. I mean, I have no idea. We have no idea from year to year. And even this year, you know, we got a continuing resolution until there was a budget passed, an authorization. So now we're chasing, you know, got to, you know, whipping everybody to spend money. Because I don't want to be standing in front of Secretary Mattis's desk on the 30th of September explaining why we haven't spent all our money. I will not be standing in front of Secretary Mattis's desk. <laughs> General Milley might be standing there. <laughs> Actually, he won't be standing there because I'm going to spend all mine first and then I'm going to spend his. <laughs> That's my goal. So, but, you know, I, I don't know. I, I think there is a recognition in Congress. I mean, I've met a lot of men. I think, but there's just, I mean, there are some people, you know, they depend on where they're from and what their experience is. But I, I think, you know, it's a lot of money and there's a lot of needs out there and I got all that. And, but I don't do politics. I worry about, you know, defending the nation and making sure the Marine Corps is the most capable, lethal, and ready force that we can have. So you know, we, we'll work with Congress. We'll answer their questions. And hopefully they'll see fit to provide us with an authorization for FY19 and bond. In the meantime, you know, we'll, we'll do our very best with what we have. I mean, we got, right now, we got money. I mean, that's, that's not the problem. I mean, the, part of our problem is we, the budget has been so erratic that the industrial base is kind of like looking at the Department of Defense like, hey, are you guys going to, I can't, I, I got to do business, I got to make my payroll, and I don't know if you're going to have money or not. So, I mean, I got money, and I, sometimes I'm, I, got, I, I need parts, and there's no parts to buy because the base has been, the industrial base has, has been kind of whipsawed by the budgeting process. Somebody in the back, way in the back, sir? It's not my place to tell the, the Army and Navy, the Air Force, how to train their officers. But we have used uh, every officer's commission, regardless of what their branch or occupation is going to be, from pilot to lawyer. We send all of them to Quantico for six-month kind of finishing school. And they, <laughs> they, they learn there to be a basic provisional rifle platoon commander. And they get to practice being a second lieutenant for six months before we throw them out into the, into the open sea. So that's what we do. We make that investment. And we think it's the right way. I mean, we, 
we're kind of an outlier in a lot of things as far as how we train and educate our Marines and our officers. And it's not my place to tell any other service how to do it. Um, we, it's, it's expensive. I mean, it costs us six months of the contract of that individual. And they have to be willing to do that. But we think it's has served us well. We've done it for decades and decades and decades, and I have no plan of changing. Yes, sir. Well, it'll be interesting. I mean, how are they being employed? I mean, they've, they've been, been employed. The force, the squadron that is for deployed in Japan has been involved with some of the force deployment things you've seen over the Korean Peninsula. Um, and they're working with other partners. How they're going to be employed on the MU, uh, the, the, you know, it was kind of a test, just, you know, go through the dynamics. Because, I mean, and when I flew out to the Essex the other day, I mean, you look at the flight deck, I mean, it's, it's, it's big ship, but it's not that big. And so, you know, when the, when the 31st Mew did it, they did it, they swapped paint a little bit. I don't want swapping paint. You can't swap paint on F, I mean, get away with that on an A4, but not on that thing. So I don't know what's going to happen, but I would just say this. So say they, they deploy and they're, gonna, they're headed to the, center, the Middle East, and there's a target requirement inside some sort of an integrated air defense environment. Um, who's the first person you're probably going to look to to go do that? So the ARGMU used to be, where are the carriers, where is the ARGMU? And that's when we, we didn't even have fixed wing. Now we've got Ospreys replaced the venerable CH-46. I have to say this because the Secretary Spencer is here, probably the greatest airplane ever built by the United States <laughs> Industrial <laughs> Complex. But uh, so now you're going to have MV-22 that have global deployability. You're going to have F-35, a fifth generation airplane. You've got a mobile platform using the sovereignty of sea to go where it wants to go. You've got a reinforced infantry battalion that can go ashore by surface and land. I, I think there'll be some interest in that. So we'll see. I don't, I don't, think, I don't see the F-35, which is another reason we want to have a Group 5 unmanned aircraft. I don't see it. It's, it's not a stealthy bomber. Because the minute you start hanging stuff off that thing, you just lost all your stealth. So it's more of a battle, battle manager. It's going to see and fuse and, and enable other, the way I've seen it used, I mean, it, it's almost like kind of a pathfinder, bless you, and it kind of gets you in and then everybody else who's more of a, a more mortal can kind of follow you in and you set the table for everybody else and then you kind of work out and everybody does their stuff and then you cover them on the way out. So we're, we're going to learn. I mean, the Air Force, I mean, there's 300 of these airplanes. Now, the Air Force, we've got about 60. The Air Force got over 200. I mean, so we're, this is it's happening. And it's just going to go faster as we learn more. I guess I got time for one more in the Coast, Coast Guard, sir. I think keeping, I mean, keeping the force, I mean, I use cyber marines. So I'm at a town hall at Mar 4 Cyber, and I do the usual pitch and thank them, and then this staff sergeant goes, he goes, hey, General, how are you going to afford to keep me? I go, I have no idea, because I can't afford to keep him, because he can walk down the street right now and make 200 grand or 300 grand working for some of you. <laughs> and I can't compete with that. I mean, I can pay him a bonus. So the one thing I we're going to do is most people that do that type of work, 
they, they do that type of work because they love that type of work, and the only thing I can give them is I can leave them alone. So now if you get, be, you get qualified as a cyber marine, you ain't never leaving, unless you want to. But if you just want to stay there and do ones and zeros and hack people and, and you know, make, make things happen bad to the bad guy, hey, I'm fine. You stay there. You ain't never leaving as long as you stay. And I'll pay you what I can pay you. Um, so I, I think the whole idea of, of you know, how we recruit people, how we retain people, I think we're going to have to be a little more flexible. I think we got, there's, there's some, I mean, I had a great idea the other day. So I'm, at, I'm on the Essex, and we're doing a town hall, and the sergeant goes, hey, I have a college degree. I don't need my 911 GI Bill, but I owe $46,000 in college debt. Why can't I use my 911 GI Bill to pay off my debt? It's like, I don't know. That's a great idea. Somebody ought to tell the commandant about that. <laughs> and so, I mean, but think about it as a recruiting and a retention thing. All right, so you come in as an officer or even enlisted, and you, you got your degree, but you owe $50,000 in debt. And I don't need 911 GI Bill, but I'll trade my 911 GI Bill for you pay my debt over time. I think that's pretty fair trade. I mean, you're going to pay, you could potentially pay the, the young man or young woman either way. But I, I, I think there's going to have to be, people are going to have to learn more than one job. I think we're going to have to be a little more flexible. But, but at some point, I mean, the corporation, I mean, I'm going to make you move. I'm going to send you overseas. I'm going to send you away. You're going to go somewhere dangerous. And that's all part of the deal. So I think we have to be open. I think your service does a, a, as good a job as any as far as retention, I think. You tell me if I'm wrong in private. But, <laughs> but uh, I, at the end of the day, you know, the reason that you get, the reason they're called orders is they're orders. And you got to go. And I, I don't know. I've never been in the civilian side of the corporate world. I'm sure there's certain things. I mean, you, you want to get promoted, you're going to get transferred. So you don't want to get promoted, then don't leave. I mean, there it is, because the, the, good, the good of the nation and the good of the service is going to trump everything at the end of the day. It doesn't mean we can't do a better job. All right, I've been run over my time. I apologize. Uh, again, thank you very much for your time. Thanks for coming today.